This is Father Gregory Pine. And this is Father Bonaventure Chapman. And welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. Boom. Father Bonaventure. Here we are. <laughs> Back together again. Living our best lives. Best lives now. Yeah, best lives now. That's what yeah. we typically do. That's what we always do, even if it's not easily identifiable as our best lives. That's right. Yeah, because why live any other life than your best life? God wouldn't let you, I guess. I best, suppose, best world possible? Leibniz? Be- <laughs> yeah, Candide? Yeah, St. Thomas Aquinas is decidedly against such a vision. Yeah, and Crucius said contra- is too. Okay, yeah. perfect. This pleases yeah. me. Yeah. Um, nice. Speaking of which, uh, recent gems, whether they be literary, apostolic, yeah. or Crucian. Well, you know, it, when you get near the end of the dissertation and, and things, and uh, things are put together, for, there's these moments where you think, I'm making this up, like I'm pushing forward a narrative. You realize like that, that it's not actually true what I'm saying, and therefore, but if I just kind of keep going, no one will notice, or if I kind of tweak the evidence in this way, and that's terrifying. But at certain points, you, you think, you know, if your director is good and you've been paying attention to this, you think, well, you know, actually, I think there's something here. Now, it could be self-deception. You might actually just not notice that you're pushing through what's actually not true. But I think actually, there, you know, after 500, 600 pages or something, there are a number of gems you think no one really cares, um, but they should. <laughs> and it's kind of cool. And then you bombard people when they ask you about it. So I think there are some things recently in this dissertation about Crucius and Kant and writing on relationship between Kant and and pietists. And it's just neat uh, to see some connections and actually think, you know, not bad. Not worth 500 pages, maybe, but still a cool insight about the fact that maybe people have misunderstood certain aspects and pe- things fall into place in the interpretation, the large schema. Just a little tweaking on it that you might have done that and get a little you know, hashtag, you know, whatever on something like that. So, so that's been fun with some pietist uh, stuff with, with Kant, uh, since people misrepresent him often, and now you have some historical evidence for it. So I'm excited about that. I assume it's something similar with uh, St. Thomas and Christology or something. You occasionally get think, uh-oh, you know, I'm just pushing forward a narrative. But maybe you think, you know, yeah, this is nice. Well done, St. Thomas. Good work. Yeah, I think that um, for me... There's like a kind of spiritual discipline of recalling throughout the course of the process that what I'm doing matters in some way, shape, or form. Now, I think Ooh. our commitment to meaning is of a similar sort, mm. uh, even if it's paper thin. You know, you got to hold on. Otherwise, you're just careening through the void. Um, but in my case, when I finish a chapter, oftentimes I've found a couple mm-hmm. of cool things to yes. be true. And I'm like, this is awesome. But then I begin a long period of reading in preparation for the next chapter. And... At this point, because I've read all the principal contributions on all the themes that are directly pertinent or even remotely pertinent to my theme, um, that I spend large, large, large periods of time reading stuff that is not at all helpful and not at all interesting. Mm-hmm. And so I have to like return to the insights of the beginning of the process and yes. recollect myself in the fact that there is something meaningful here. There is some con- like contribution here, not just in the um, self-aggrandizing sense of, you know, like people are it's like, yeah. who gives? <laughs> but yeah. it's in the sense of, okay, I think this is true about Christ and his salvation yeah. and its communication, which is to say, you know, its manifestation in his flesh and his communication by means of faith in the sacraments. And that's cool, but uh, I'm pretty distant from some of those insights at this point because I've just been reading not that. I wonder if there should be something for a PhD, uh, part of the process, where instead of just the def- not only the oral defense of it and the dissertation, but you should also have to teach like a class to fifth graders or something on your dissertation <laughs> or 20 minutes or something so that you are forced to explain it in the simplest terms. And if you can't explain something in the simple terms uh, that has effect and meaning and significance, then perhaps you've just been making something up that isn't valuable. I don't know what in the world classroom, but if there's anyone who wants to, yeah, if any fifth graders want to hear about um, Kant's early pietist metaphysics and morals, um, then, or if he wants to hear about Christ's salvation, I'm, they'll probably go for you instead of me. <laughs> but maybe there's some German, there may be some Lutherans out in Minnesota that are interested in, in, uh, in hearing about it. But that it does force you when, when you're asked about the dissertation topic, initially you think, I, I could, if, it was, if, it, if I could explain it to you simply, then it wouldn't be a dissertation. But then you think, no, I've really got to. And I've, I've, I finally, it took me about nine months to come up with a three-minute kind of spiel on it that people say, oh, cool, I guess that makes sense. But it's not quite the whole thing because then they could just write it. 
Mm. So I don't know. You've probably you've probably fit, come up to faster than I did. But it took me a while to come up with an actual decent elevator pitch for a 600-page dissertation. Yeah, I have a 15-second version, a minute version, a three-minute yeah. version, and then like the read-the-book version. That's um, yeah. That's it's right. like when somebody asks you where you're from. I'm from Newtown, Pennsylvania, which is 35 minutes northeast of Philadelphia and like 15 minutes west of Trenton. So depending on who's asking and what level of familiarity they have with the tri-state area, I will give different answers. So some t- oftentimes I'll just say, well, like people in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, mostly Philadelphia. But for some people, if it's like Bratislava, Slovakia, like, where are you from? I'm like, New York City. They're like, ooh. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Suburb. <laughs> yeah. Suburb of New York or yeah. Philadelphia or Bucks County or across the river from Trent or so I have similar approaches. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. But yeah. We're not talking about our dissertations because we tend to make our dissertations the theme of every God splitting episode. So maybe we should get into the subject. Your listeners, matter. almost over. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, that was only 10 minutes of chit chat. It happens. Life's crazy. All right. So we're going to talk in this episode about a contemporary author named Kazuo Ishiguro. And mm. he is living, which is a rarity for us. I think we've only done maybe one or two episodes about living authors, yeah. like Cormac McCarthy, maybe. Yep. And um, so Kazuo Ishiguro was born in 1954 in Nagasaki, Japan. He mm. moved as a child at the age of six to Great Britain, and he works in English. Um, and he has published a few books, the names of which I will now read. So uh, the first is A Pale View of the Hills, then An Artist of the Floating World, which we're going to talk about, then Remains of the Day, which we're also going to talk about, and then The Unconsoled, When We Were Orphans, Never Let Me Go, The Buried Giant, and most recently, 2021, Clara and the Sun, and we'll make uh, tangential references to some of those insofar as we have leafed through them slash read through them. All right. Um, so we together read uh, An Artist of the Floating World and Remains of the Day. Mm-hmm. So maybe just get us started as we think through principal themes, why it matters for a Christian to read these texts, why maybe it doesn't matter for a Christian to read these texts, or what we see when we look. Yeah, that's so part of the reason why we read Ishiguro is not just uh, he's a Nobel Prize winner in 2017, but We've been trying to branch out and read from different countries, get literature perspectives from different areas of France and Spain and this and sort of thing. And Ishiguro is from Japan, but uh, speaks and writes in English, and it's impeccable, impeccable English. And they're very approachable. So there's, it's it's a beautiful style. It's pleasurable. I think they're I think these are books where I read in like two nights or something. You couldn't couldn't put them down. They're just too good. People might be familiar with Remains of the Day, Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson. They made a movie of that not too long ago, as well. Um, but what's interesting about those two books, they're similar. They focus on one particular character in uh, Artist of the Floating World. It's on a, it's on a, a Japanese father, with, uh, he has, and he has children who are getting married or attempting to get married, one of them, and the struggles with that. Um, and it's set in just after, after World War II or so. And then Remains of the Day is similar. It's about a butler. It's an English, English setting, uh, but a, a butler after the war reflecting. And they're both reflecting on the key events that have happened before, before you're actually meeting them. And what's amazing about Ishiguro in both those cases is that you, after the first couple pages, you basically know what happened. It's like an event happened and the book is the unfolding of revela- progressive revelation of what the meaning for that and how to live through that thing. Um, and you basically, in a sense, know what it is, but you still want to know more. And you want to find out the details of it and fill it out further and further. And that's by the end of the book, you finally get the full revelation, you could say. But it's, it's one of those weird things where it's ever ancient, ever new, Augustinian kind of trope. It's both, you, this is exactly what you expected, but it's entirely different than you expected or entirely new or entirely more robust or entirely more uh, beautiful and more complicated. So that, that, that his style with those two books, at least, uh, is has just literarily, and then, of course, has mean points of memory on it, of p- revealing something that you already know or unveiling it more, going deeper into it. That's what I was caught and just struck. One of the things that struck me about his, his style in those two books. Yeah, I think that when you, okay, so you've described this phenomenon where mm-hmm. a thing has happened, and then it's a matter of unpacking what has happened or progressively revealing what has happened. And in the course of that progress, or in the course of that unfolding, you see the individual relate to his past. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's not just like a straightforward recounting of facts. Those facts are all colored by an interpretation. So I like to say that there are two aspects of human life. I mean, you could break this down in a thousand ways, but the living of life and then the interpreting of life. Mm-hmm. And the interpreting of life 
you know, the better that it's done actually helps you to live and is in fact part of the living. So when you go back and revisit your past, sometimes people are trying to rationalize or justify, excuse, condemn, accuse, whatever. You know, there are many ways in which to relate to ourselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis past events. But ultimately, you know, I think a kind of simple Christian disposition is to be reconciled to them. Mm -hmm. Here are things that happen. Some things are good, some things are bad. Obviously, I'd like not to repeat the bad. I'd like to heal the relationships that were wounded by the bad. And I would like to magnify the good by God's grace. That's somewhat of a simplistic way to go about it. But the thing that's fascinating about these two books in particular is that you see the struggle of reconciliation. And it's not always even-handed or it's not always honest. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily because we're dealing with a bad person. We're just dealing with mm -hmm. a weak and wounded person. We're dealing with a person in all of his kind of glorious and banal limitations. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, as a reader, have a kind of insight that he doesn't. And it's not that it's like an unreliable narrator, sure. but it's, it's just not an omnipotent or an omniscient narrator. And that puts you in a kind of interesting position where you're like, oh, like how sympathetic are you and how sympathetic am I? You know, so it, it gets interesting there. And I think the other thing about that is the self-deception level. So you say these, these guys, these two men and the people involved in these stories, but mainly focus on a, a butler in the Remains of the Day case and a, and a, a retired artist in artist of the floating world case they're not they're not lying or intending they're not bad people they're ordinary people uh, who have been around extraordinary events in a way and they're not trying to deceive anyone about them really they might be deceiving about responding to but they're not intending to, it's it's almost like a rationalization or a justification you're watching out play out a psychological drama which is i think part of our fallenness that we Oftentimes, when grappling with a difficult situation or, or something we've done that we feel bad about or we're not sure we're supposed to feel about it, we then start to tell a story that's towards the truth, but not yet the truth. And you're working out, and then you get caught in situations where if you just said, if you just spoke truly about it, you'd be able to move forward, but you've now created a second kind of storyline to it, and you're trying to live and play out a role in that telling of it and get that to the truth from total falsity and in those both those cases you see played out the psychological drama of trying to come to grips with a bad thing done or a difficult situation or a mistake made without just the black and white conversion like i i, I did this and then all of a sudden i was struck down and the you know saul of tarsus kind of paul uh, conversion experience and acts, you could say, but rather the more common experience of a progressive realization of 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 one's mistakes or one's one's need for redemption, and and a progressive ex acceptance of that or wandering away from it. I think it's similar to when we talk about people ask sometimes a confessional, can I, I I've confessed this before, can I confess again? And I, I it seems like to me confession it's you you can always get deeper on things, not to be scrupulous, but you sometimes realize I confess this, but it's five years later. I I didn't realize how much uh, harm I'd done, and I'm more contrite now. I feel more sorrow. I've I'm willing to tell the truth about myself in that situation when I wasn't I wasn't really able to do it there, but now I want to I need to tell that truth and confess what I actually did, so that there's this progressive unveiling in the truth of oneself. And both these play, the, play out and one accepts and one rejects, you could say. Yeah, I think that this idea of penitence is a good way by which mm. to approach his literary genius in these two books in particular. Because in the first, An Artist of the Floating World, you have this painter who is the father of two children, one of whom is married, the other of whom is trying to get married. Um, and he's reflecting back on his life through the lens of his children's quasi-rejection of him and of his legacy. Because, you know, prior to the war, you know, Japanese nationalist, he got very involved in that movement and painted a lot of things that would have been seen as like anti-Chinese yeah, propaganda, propaganda yeah. right? And so after the war, like many high-ranking Japanese officials or businessmen or artists uh, would have either, you know, publicly confessed to their crimes or some would have committed suicide as a way by which to kind of free their family of that mm -hmm. guilt. But he refused to do so. And in a certain sense, he's still trying to reconcile himself to his past, and he's approaching it, mm -hmm. uh, but he's approaching it slowly. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a kind of parallel experience in our own lives is when you realize that you offend somebody, 
and there's a right way to apologize mm -hmm. because if you do it very very unwillingly then the person is not satisfied by that but if you do it over willingly then the person sees it as a kind of cheap mm -hmm. reconciliation or a kind of cheap apology so you need to be able to communicate the fact that i understand this right i know this and i see how it affected you I want to reaffirm the love that I have for you, and I want to show you that I am penitent, right? So I want to look back at the sin. I want to acknowledge it as bad. You know, I want to lament it. I want to hate it. And then I want to incorporate that in a story whereby our relationship going forward is better, right? Not merely repaired, but also flourishes beyond its present bounds. And so I think that there's, you can't be like overwilling. You can't be underwilling. You have to show yourself genuinely mm -hmm. willing, but in the context of the relationship. And so then in the other one, in the remains of the day, you see a similar phenomenon where this butler is reflecting back on the legacy of his, his master, master, who was uh, subsequently like, understood to be a Nazi sympathizer. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's kind of vacillating between rationalization, justification, and then, you know, expiation, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's just it's like a fascinating back and forth. But I think it's cool insofar as that both are making their way towards a greater honesty. Yeah, which for me I think is an just an interesting phenomenon to watch. It is to see to see played out the deepening embrace of yourself and the fact that we don't know right off off the bat in any situation what it meant for us and who we are in that, but we have we have to see ourselves through memory. Augustine talks about this a lot, but also through others. These other people they're reflecting off, so we're kind of we're reflecting our narratives off them, so we can see in a mirror in a way. I'm think of like. Uh, the, the Knight of Mirrors in Man of La Mancha when he comes at the end and to Don Quixote and shows off his, his, who he really is there and how people serve this role to see, these, to see ourselves and what was really going on there because we, we can be so self-deceived and not because we're evil per se at all, but because we're not strong enough, we're too weak to see full on what we have done and who we are. The other thing mentioned about this and I, before we move on to these other things is uh, the getting back to the progressive revelation, you could say, um, it reminded me, of course, that how I think Christianity uh, and the faith is is developed and brought out. That there is this event in in Jesus Christ's life, in the death and resurrection, his time with the apostles, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. I mean, the the New Testament is oh, it's really condensed, you know, this experience. But the church then reflects over and over its own role in this sort of thing, its own human role as well, but also is unpacking what's going on such that the the doctrines of the faith, the Trinity, the Incarnation, all these things that come later are are what happened. You would have said right away, oh yeah, of course God, Christ was, was God-man, or of course God Christ was equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit, but that they had to be unpacked through reflecting upon after time and memory of what these events meant. So it was this unpacking and progressive revelation of the faith. And I thought that to see that in like a human version about how we do that in our story, but then to reflect on how it, of course, that's, that's how the faith is worked out. That's not something adding on new, but rather deepening the reflection of what actually happened, what events, what experiences, what people, uh, what revelation there was. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of adjacent to our understanding of salvation history. The sense that, all right, there's a salvation history, and that salvation history is willed by God for our salvation. Well, I guess that's, I mean, the adjectival use of whatever, doesn't matter. But um, so that God is leading us through whatever these series of experiences, pedagogically, one might say, or even mm -hmm. mystagogically, so as to conform us to himself, specifically, you know, through the sending of his son as the principal means whereby to accomplish that end. So he wants us to be assimilated to him, to be conformed to him through this particular means, which is historical, personal, yep. contingent, concrete, material, however you want to describe it. And so the experiences through which we pass all help us to appreciate what has gone before. Mm -hmm. All of that is part of like what you described as unpacking or unfolding or appropriating or however you want to describe it. But that sense that like, because we are what we are, because we, we are human beings with a human nature, we live in time, right? We have a kind of temporal expression of our personality and identity. And as we pass through the fullness of, you know, the concrete and particular expression of our human nature, that we're going to be able to reach back and pull things out of the past that we weren't able to appreciate at the time. And it's not because we weren't paying sufficient attention. It's because we hadn't yet lived. Yeah. Right. So it's not like you do a thing and then it's dead. You do a thing and then you continue to draw from that thing until you until you're dead. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, because the the events of events of revelation, the events of history are events involving people and people aren't aren't like. Uh, I don't know, f 
freeze frames kind of things. We live and we continue over space and time, and so we carry with us what's going on. So the event, all events in a sense, have, might have a starting point, but they never really have an ending point. You know, the events continue on in different modes and different different uh, patterns, you could say, different levels of awareness, but they're always, in a sense, you know, you could say a secular example, World War II is still happening in a way it's still being worked out, not just by historians, but also by, by memories of the people involved in it, the grandparents, the last generation, like the last soldier is about to die or getting close to, to dying. So, but that event, World War II, that of, is, is work, being worked out from that. So it might be getting less and being, being more, well, less aggressive, you could say, uh, or present, but in its absence, even by missing these people, it's ha having an effect. It becomes an event we reflect on historically as opposed to personally, but it's still coloring and shaping all of the humans that, that, are in this, that are around and our families as they pass through. So events have a starting point, but they don't really, they don't really have an ending, end point, end point. Yeah, and I think, so just bringing in some of the other novels, mm -hmm. um, I read The Unconsoled, which is about a pianist and conductor who goes to an Eastern European city, something like Budapest or Bratislava or something like that. And he's constantly getting confused because he's supposed to be in places, but he doesn't show up in those places because he's not duly apprised of his schedule. And then, you know, like people ask him for favors, which, say, which they say are going to take three minutes and end up taking half a day. And he finds himself in compromised situations. And the, the, the whole of it has a kind of dreamlike quality. Mm -hmm. And it's like when you pass through a dream and all of a sudden you're in somebody's basement and they're asking you to give an address on 19th century locomotive progress. And you're like, oh my gosh. It's I difficult guess, to do. Yeah, I, I, I studied this at some point, but it just seems like a long time ago. Um, but the whole book kind of reads like that for 500 pages, which was super destabilizing. And so I think it shows by negation what you just described by assertion, mm -hmm. namely that there is, there ought to be a continuity mm -hmm. and that we are, you know, like both moving through the events, but also kind of pull, pulling the events together in our person, um, yes. which is an interesting thing to think about. So well, that's why dreams, um, dreams are, are weird. And you can tell a dream is is, is not a, a real event because it doesn't follow the rules of, of time and space and our normal experience. I have lots to say about this with Kant because for pulling together experiences is what the transcendental unity of apperception does and what the soul does in him so that he has a, a, an account of consciousness as being and the experience of consciousness being something that we pull together in a way and unify in ourselves whereas dreams it's really hard to do that because they don't follow laws of causality and, th and, and substance and the things we're used to. So I think everyone kind of has a sense where dreams start and end or what, what's a dream, what's reality, because they don't correspond to this continuous presence and awareness uh, in, in our lives that we inhabit. It's not a space we really exist in. Yeah. And then the other two books that I've uh, read are, so the first one is called uh, Never Let Me Go, and then the other one is called The Buried Giant. And both of them are basically stories of progressive dread, right? So a situation that becomes more and more dreadful. Uh, in the first case, it's because certain persons know that they're destined to die for reasons which will be revealed when you read the book. Uh, but it's like their relationships in light of their mortality, but their mortality that's coming from them. Mm -hmm. And not only like do you not know the day nor the hour, but you suspect that it's going to be as soon as tomorrow in a, mm -hmm. uh, in a pretty rough way. And then with The Buried Giant, it's like a kind of dreadful anticipation of the failure of love. People holding on to relationships which come apart in their grasp. And I think, again, by way of negation, kind of sheds light on the assertion or sheds light on the affirmation. I think there's, uh, it's, it's, it's commonly said of Christianity that it breaks us out of this eternal recurrence of the same or it saves us from certain pagan narratives of fate mm -hmm. or fatalism, right? This idea that uh, we can't really make anything of our lives because there are just too many market factors which tend towards destruction and depression. Whereas we, there's been a principle introduced into our salvation history, which affords us hope, right? Which affords us an outlook on the future, which goes beyond the limitations of our human weakness and woundedness. So, yeah, I don't know your thoughts on that as we wind up. Well, I think in, in the, the Christian vision is, is of, a, of a line with a starting point that heads out. It's a ray, I guess, mathematically, right? So the starting point heads out for each of us, uh, which is which is what history is. So in a sense, Christianity is the most historical of religions, not just because it makes historical claims about contingent events uh, that were permeated by the divine, but that actually it is metaphysically a story that goes on forever and is continual, continually understood and deepened in union with Christ. Whereas the so much of the modern world is now either cyclical, like multiverse, it's always going to happen again, it's been happening forever, or 
it has it's a it's a it's a point a line segment that has two points on it, and it started at some point maybe, and it's going to end at some point. And neither of those are are not only appealing but make sense of the the experience of being a human, which is an experience of a ray, not a not a, a line segment and not a circle. So you shouldn't be satisfied with either the pagan view or the or the modern multiverse view because it doesn't correspond to your regular experience, let alone to the cosmic experience and the transcendent, transcendent accounts of Christianity. Boom. All right. So that is, uh, is all for us on Kazuo Ishiguro. We read uh, some of his bibliography at the beginning of the episode, but uh, yeah, recommend those books heartily. They've been the occasion for good conversation between us, and they touch on themes which, whether he knows it or not, uh, are illuminating for uh, the living of the Christian life. Mm-hmm. So thanks, as always, for listening to God's Planning. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please do like the episode, subscribe on YouTube or on your podcast app, and leave a five-star review. If you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, you can follow the link in the description or show notes, depending on where you're listening. And in those description and or show notes, you'll find links to shop our merchandise and to get information for upcoming God's Planning events. So our prayers are for you. Please pray for us, and we'll catch you next time on God's Planning.